welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host, a special remote bookmark with Most Reverend Peter Elliott, the Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus of Melbourne, Australia, down under. Uh, the book Eucharist and Covenant in John's Last Supper account by Monsignor Anthony La Femina, published by New Hope Publications, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, all things Catholic. And we welcome you to Bookmark. Uh, Bishop Elliott. Thank you. So before we get into talking about this particular book that you're presenting, which also uh, uh, features an introduction by Cardinal Burke, uh, what was your connection with Monsignor Anthony La Femina? I first met Tony when I joined the Vatican and uh, was working in the Pontifical Council for the Family. And he was an official like me, and his office was right next to mine, and I was a nervous new curial official, and he was my mentor in many ways, not only with good advice, but with a, a wry sense of humor. Let me ask you, with, 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 with doing that, is it's interesting in the book itself he talks about the reason that he wrote the book and that there was an inspiration. Somebody told him he thought, they thought that God wanted him to write a book about the Eucharist, right? Yes, that was going back to when he was young. He was associated closely to a, a mystical woman who was a parishioner in the parish where he lived. And he, he calls her the Star of Mary, I believe. And there's an appendix to the book which is one of her mystical experiences uh, that happened at Mass. And that encouraged him to go more deeply into his Eucharistic theology and faith. And it's interesting because he himself talks about the fact that for a long time it was very, it was very difficult for him to figure out what kind of book he was supposed to really write. And he came upon a very interesting approach that this book is centered on. Why do you explain what that approach is? The approach is uh, it's a combination of theology, philosophy, and mystical theology and spirituality to blend, it very clearly planned, on the problem that we've always faced in studying the Gospels, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a direct account of the Eucharist which is used at the consecration in the Mass. But when we turn to John, we, the Last Supper, we can't find that. Mm -hmm. It's just not there. Mind you, John has a whole chapter, number six, which is a beautiful exposition of the Eucharist. Right. My flesh, my blood, we all know it. But, and scholars have often scratched their heads and said, why doesn't he have, this is my body, this is my blood, etc." Right, and so what's interesting with this is that he talks about how the idea of the feet washing was key to his understanding of why John wrote the way he did. Yes, he argues that the feet washing of the apostles took the place of the words of institution, which weren't needed um, because in the discourse at the Last Supper in John, which is rather long, mm -hmm. you have a theology of the Eucharist, implicit vine and branches, etc. But the foot washing of the first priests of the church, and that's what they were, priests of the New Covenant, the Melchizedek priesthood, their foot washing united them to Christ in covenant. And that's a, a key word in this book is covenant. Mm -hmm. And the covenant... A covenant is different to a contract. We've got to get that clear. In the Jewish traditions and in the Middle East generally in those times, a covenant was a gift of a higher power to a lower power. It wasn't a contract between equals. So the sovereign king would have a covenant with his people and he'd require things of them, called a suzerainty, um, and on, in return he'd protect them and make laws. And that's the same with God's relationship with Israel and what we call the Ten Commandments and the First Covenant we call the Old Testament. But the New Covenant in Christ is different. It's sealed in his blood, his own blood. 
-hmm. So we have an act of uniting these men, and it's interesting, only men, for, for the foot washing in mm -hmm. the Bible, and he's uniting these men to his priestly work, and Peter plays up and says, you're not going to wash my feet, because that's what a slave or a servant did, because the feet were not regarded favorably in the culture, they were regarded as in, undignified. And Jesus is kneeling there with the towel and the bowl, and he says, no, if I don't wash you, you're not part of me. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the big keys, I think, in this beautiful book to the unity with Christ achieved by accepting his covenant offer as the higher power symbolized in the humble act of washing, for even accepting that. Mm -hmm. That's the, the part of the mystery of the Eucharist that's implicit or analogous, is the word he uses, in the washing of the feet. Now, it's interesting, too, because of the idea that there's been uh, recently over the last, let's say, 30, 40 years, sometimes concerns expressed over, you know, should women's feet be washed or other people's feet be washed because there was a connection that people saw based on the Last Supper and this particular perspective that the Monsignor brings forward. Do you see that as an issue at all? I think it's a dead issue because Pope Francis has already loosened that up uh, very quickly after he became Pope. I'm not going to criticize that because he plugs into the human dimension of the washing of the feet, which is a servant church right. washing the feet of everybody. That's a humanitarian interpretation, and it's perfectly correct. Mm -hmm. But then you get this mystical, deeper interpretation that Monsignor La Femina finds in the Last Supper account. And that would say, imply you never did the symbolic washing we have in the liturgy of the church and various religious orders. You would only have men to keep that symbolism up. But if you go in the humanitarian direction, you could wash anybody's feet. So right. I, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's a variation in approach. Understood. Do you think uh, his perspective was impacted by the fact that he was a canon lawyer and how he looked at this, especially, as you said, in relation to a covenant? Yes, I do. I think that's a very, very a correct insight because mm -hmm. I'm not a canon lawyer. But I would say to canon lawyers, well, every car needs mechanics, we'll put it that way. And Tony was, he made it clear to me he was trained in scholastic philosophy and canon law before he came to work in Rome. Mm -hmm. And yet that surprised me. I, thought, What's he? Well, I said, what are you doing in all this scripture stuff? And he went right into the depths. Of, he wrote to all sorts of scripture scholars to ran this past them even scholars he didn't agree with. And I said, but you're a canon lawyer. And he said, no, the covenant resonates with me. He understood covenant within the law of the church, which expresses the one covenant in many ways. <clears throat> right, and, you, and he even talks about in the forward here that uh, His Eminence Cardinal Burke put together, he talks about the idea that Moses, Moses reminded, thinking about the Old Testament, reminded the people that fidelity to the covenant of mercy and love which God the Father had formed with them meant total dependence upon God and His providence and therefore perfect obedience to His law which He has written into creation. Uh, that is perfectly true and uh, I know Cardinal Burke well and it's, it expresses his deep understanding of the law of the church. The other image that you get here, too, that he talks about is uh, between Moses is also the manna and the idea of the manna, the wondrous sign of God, faithful, enduring love, foreshadowed the definitive sign of his love in sending his only begotten son and obviously uh, in human flesh. Yes, this is where the incarnation is essential. The God in flesh who then gives the flesh of his son for the life of the world, which is the heavenly bread, the manna for God's new people, everybody who is baptized into the covenant. Right. Uh, baptism crops up here because washing implies baptism. Right. And many commentators have said, oh, this is a, uh, analogous to baptism. And, and Tony said, yeah, but that's not the whole story. 
And I would add uh, a view I hold, which I built upon Tony's views, that the washing of the apostles is analogous to Moses washing the feet of the first Old Testament priests, Aaron, etc. In the last chapter of Exodus, there's a record of that. They had to be washed, be prepared. Now, the washing in both cases is to take away sin, but is to invest them with priesthood. So in the case of the apostles, and there are references here to Satan and evil, and that has to be washed away. Um, that's part of the process. But I do think it reflects um, priesthood and a new priesthood that doesn't depend on what family you're born into, the Aaronic priesthood. Right. Now, he also comments that contemplating the great mystery of the Eucharistic sacrifice, the Monsignor understood or struggled to know exactly the Lord wanted him to write about the Holy Eucharist in most perf perfect expression of unceasing and immeasurable love for men. And again, so in contemplating this and, and coming up with this new approach, how long did it take him to actually write the book? Years and years, because I remember him discussing this with me uh, when I entered the Curia in 1987. He said he was writing a book. And so we're certainly starting then because it wasn't published till quite recently. And then he died a couple of years ago, very peacefully and beautifully. And so I, I, right through my work in the Curia from uh, 1987 mm -hmm. to 1997, those 10, 11 years, Tony would keep me apprised of what he was doing, although he did go in the middle of that time, he did return to the United States and retired to Venice, Florida. Mm -hmm. well, I, visited him, I visited him there, by the way, as a young, a new bishop, and we, we talked about Gilsa, as he calls it, the John Last Supper of Count Gilsa. We right. talked about it, and of course, his other interest was exorcism. He was a very skilled exorcist. Oh, really? I didn't know that. There's, there's one term he relates to, and I had to read up on what, what a vassal treaty was and why he thought that was an important understanding. Well, that's, that is the, the, the construct that Brother McCarthy was an expert on this. Uh, I use McCarthy's work in my own thesis on mm -hmm. marriage covenant before I met Tony. Then I discovered he was drawing on McCarthy too. He was the expert who explored what covenant really meant in the context of the Middle East. The vassal treaty, again, is this higher power mm -hmm. reaching down and giving a lower power, a citizen, for example, or a member of a religious cult, certain privileges. But in return, obedience is required. Mm -hmm. So the vassal, it's of course a medieval feudal mm -hmm. term, not entirely perfect, but it does give us a picture. And it reminds us that the covenant between us and God doesn't come from our side. It, like every grace, it's the great grace of covenant, it's given to us. And God will honor it, that there's a condition here, if we keep our side of it. Right. One of the things that struck me, and you talked about the JLSA, and in chapter one, it was helpful to read that to realize what he was referring to. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking at the John and I and John I uh, Last Supper account, but it's interesting because one of the reasons I guess he wanted to counteract and show the Eucharistic aspect in John's Gospel, uh, in the washing of the feet, is uh, he talks about Rudolf Bultmann asserts that John is John's reason for omitting the Eucharist in his Last Supper account is due to the fact that he considered the Eucharist Eucharist to be irrelevant, superfluous, or even suspicious. And I'm glad you chose that sentence. It jumped out of the page at me. Uh, he was very much against the theologies, if we may stretch the word, of the German skeptical critic, Rudolf Bultmann. Well, Bultmann came from a liberal Protestant tradition which didn't regard sacraments as important. Mm -hmm. So he had a predisposition, let's say, not to see the Eucharist as central to John. Yet it is there. I mean, anybody from the street or the supermarket picking up a New Testament reads John chapter 6. Right. And I've said to Protestant friends, I said, how do you get around that? I mean, that's Catholic theology. Catholic and Orthodox, high Anglicans and that believe this literally. And, it, and it's the great 
great gift of the Eucharist, which at the time Christ preached that discourse in chapter 6 was rejected by people who either couldn't or wouldn't understand it. And Bultmann, I'm afraid, got into that category. He says here, in seeking to understand the foot washing, it is imperative to keep in mind it is a mysterious action, and he highlights that. In, in its regard, Jesus said, what I am doing to you right now, you don't understand, but afterward you'll understand. He goes on to say, this study proposal is consistent with the observation that John, who is called the theologian in the Byzantine tradition, often teaches points of revelation in his gospel through analogy. And that's a, you were talking earlier about the analogous nature of this. Well, we have a lot of analogies in John's gospel, the vine and the branches, um, Christ as the shepherd goes on. There's a whole string of them, and the scholars have always listed them. But this one of the the suffering servant who kneels to wash feet it is 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 one one of the greatest ones um, that John uses. But analogy analogy is the the key word here, which is similar to parable, metaphor, simile, mm -hmm. but it's at the same time a bit different. But what they did understand later, of course, was that they were priests of a new covenant mm -hmm. and a new people of God. And they had a sacrifice, one sacrifice, which he emphasizes very clearly. Tony is very strong on this. Mm -hmm. The sacrifice of Calvary is the same as the Mass. Mm -hmm. Of course, but in the Mass it's under a different form. Right. The Council of Trent said, I think it's unbloody. Unfortunate expression, but it gets the idea across. And right. chapter 6, resolution of the dilemma, which was obviously, as we talked about earlier, the whole premise of the book, he writes that John attributed to the foot washing the identical circumstances, attributes, and effects predicated, say, of the Eucharist and in the synoptic and Pauline Last Supper accounts, and thus made the foot washing an, an analog of the Eucharist. Consequently, what John attributes to the foot washing, he is attributing to the Eucharist. Exactly, and that's a, that's probably the key concept that Tony wanted to get across in his meticulous research. And it, it means we reread the gospel at this point and we move away from the humanitarian interpretation, which is true, mm -hmm. uh, like the surface of a parable has a truth to it, and even in second meeting, we go to another level of meaning, which is the way we do read scriptures, if we're sensible and not fundamentalist, um, reading things into it or not ultra-liberal and dismissing it, those extremes, we find levels of meaning, and this is the deeper meaning. And it's, it's, it's certainly his, his um, case is that this is the Eucharist. He also puts the foot washing into the context of the dialogue of Christ at the Last Supper mm -hmm. recorded by John. And I think the foot washing comes just after that in the historical account. You have the high priestly prayer of Christ. And this emphasis, you and me, I and you, be one uh, with, with the apostles and in a, a different sense with every baptized Christian. Right. Also in chap chapter 7, I think, uh, it hits at home, uh, and you, you alluded to this before, the sacrificial nature of, of the Eucharist and that importance, and he talks about the Eucharistic sacrifice is the source and summit of the whole Christian life. Do you think in some ways we've lost some of that? Well, those beautiful words come directly from the Second Vatican Council. Right. And I've been doing a lot of research recently on the Council 60 years later, and it came clearly to me that many things, many beautiful gifts in the Council have been just tossed aside by, by many Catholics. Okay, you can't expect people 60 years later to remember it. Older people like me do. But most people who are active at the Council have gone to God. But a lot of beautiful things. And that's one of the summit and source. Now, in the field of liturgy, where I do a lot of working and writing, particularly ceremonial, that's an axiom we stick to, summit and source the summit of the church's activity, and more deeply, the source, the pierced heart of Christ, if we can use another analogy. 
Now, one of the things I know that surveys have indicated here in the United States and probably elsewhere in the world has been uh, the amount of the amount of people who no longer think of the Eucharist as really being the body and blood, soul and divinity sure. of Christ. Why do you think that's an issue? It's a very big issue because it's the center of the church's life. You lose the summit. The Eucharist just becomes a holy meal or a brotherly, sisterly kind of get-together. So it's not a summit anymore, it's just a function. And it's not the source because you've lost sight of grace and transubstantiation and the real sacrifice. The beautiful principles from Trent that are repeated in the Second Vatican Council and documents, you've lost sight of that. And unfortunately, it's, I, I would put it down now to secularization. When people can't understand a deep thing, it's often because they get bombarded with the banal, ordinary, worldly meaning of things. So the Eucharist becomes a bit of a get-together with bread and wine. And that's mm -hmm. not only radical, you say, obvious, but it's a terrible loss of faith. And I know Tony was deeply concerned about that. We talked about that because when I was working with him, that was already unfolding in various surveys in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, how was his book and his thesis that he put forward here, you know, accepted or not accepted in general? Did people go and read it and say, oh, these are credible insights, uh, let's study this more? Did people say, oh, well, he's stretching to make a point? Well, read one way, you can say he's stretching, but then he gives you a lot of evidence and uses methods and draws on philosophy, theology, liturgy, Mm -hmm. scripture analysis and he did run the book past many scholars some of them were people he didn't necessarily agree with but he got a favorable result from most of them which yeah. I found very interesting he showed me that um, scholars who I would regard as rather skeptical about scriptures although they're experts in the field uh, and others who have a, a deeper faith approach they all said look you're on to something mm -hmm. to sum it up Right. So he, I don't remember ever getting a negative approach. And you have a scholar like the greatest English theologian uh, today yeah. is a, a Dominican, Father Aidan Nichols. Yeah. And Aidan thought it was marvellous. I, I used to know Aidan when we were at Oxford together, mm -hmm. and he was Johnny Nichols, and uh, that's more than 50 years ago now. And, and if, if Aidan says something is okay, you know he's thought it through and it's very accurate. Right. Now, you've done a great job representing your friend, uh, the Monsignor, but you're also an author. Uh, is, do I understand that you're working on a book? Uh, I'm about to republish in the United States through Ignatius a book I published two years ago uh, in Australia called The Sexual Revolution, and it goes into the history ideology and the power it's a disturbing book mm -hmm. has to be but it's a complete guide insofar as you can do that to how this phenomenon has developed over 300 years mm -hmm. it's a long history the sexual revolution and now we're really in the pits of it and uh, it's something that christians of all and in fact all people of faith including our jewish brothers and sisters mm -hmm. have to be on the alert for and wake up to because mm -hmm. every child picks up a phone now and gets pornography if they wish. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got this uh, dreadful social trend, particularly in Western countries, so-called, and I've uh, analysed that in this easy-to-read book. It's a mm -hmm. so, solid little paperback, very easy to read, mm -hmm. not too technical. I wrote it so anyone could understand it, unpack the history and the difficult thing of ideology like LGBTIQ, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And explain what that, where that came from. And a lot of people have no idea where that came from. It didn't fall out of the sky or pop up. It was very carefully thought out by, I think, a few, uh, uh, so we say, ideological crooks. Right. So there we that's the, that's the latest book. And uh, I, I have republishing my ceremonial mag manuals on the ceremonies of the modern Roman Rite that is the post-conciliar liturgy, mm -hmm. and that's a field I've worked in for, since I was in the Vatican. When Tony was writing his book, I was writing mine in the Vatican, 
because you get spare time there, believe it or not. <laughs> and you've got to apply yourself to something else or you'd go crazy. And that was my way of not going crazy. And I think the same applied to Tony. Well, we appreciate you spending your time with us to talk about. We look forward to, to seeing that book, maybe talking, a chance to talk to you about that book as well. Speaking with the most reverend Peter Elliott, Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus of Melbourne, Australia, presenting a book written by his friend, Anthony LaFemina, he's a Monsignor, uh, Eucharist and Covenant in John's Last Supper Account, a really interesting book, interesting take, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, all things Catholic. Thank you so much, Bishop, and thank you all for joining us here on Bookmark. Thank you.